Hi guys! So today's video is going to be all about integration. Yes, we are going to hit up past papers starting from 2019 all the way down to as far as we can go. I'm going to try my best to not make the video too long, so just bear with me, okay? Um, so we're looking at 2019 here, and I've pulled out, I think this is from question two, uh, uh, integration by parts question. So I would have placed in blue there the um what standard integration by parts looks like and you guys know it's always in that uh format of you have uh the integral of u uh v dash with respect to whatever your question is about in this case dx is equal to uv minus the integral of v u prime dx um where v v prime u prime v dash u dash whatever you want to use to describe that symbolic notation, those are your differentiated terms. So first up, they have let f sub n of x be equal to the integral of ln x to the power of n. Now, essentially, you visually see one, uh, you know, um, function there, but we can rewrite that so that we can actually apply integration by parts to this question. What if we rewrite this as 1 multiply by ln of x and dx? Now, why did I do this? Well, because they're asking us to show that uh, the integral is equal to this. And... Uh, because of that minus sign and the presence of two terms, my knowledge of integration by parts picks up that uh, the format is the same. You have that minus sign there and then you have two terms on either side. So it kind of highlights to me, uh, you know, it was understood integration by parts is what you needed to use in order to do this question. And it's kind of an easy one. How do I know which... Uh, of these, should I make my u or my v prime? Once again, kind of try to work backwards. Observe that in your show that part. Observe that you have x there. Now, how can we move from 1 and ln x to the power of n to getting x present anywhere? Well, we know that if we were to integrate 1, you would definitely get x. So therefore, if we have to integrate 1, then that means that we should set our v dash to be equal to 1 and our u to be equal to our second function there within that uh, integral sign. Now, in order to complete integration by parts, all we need to do are uh, to find values of v. And v would obviously be the integral of 1, and that is very simply x. And also, we would need the value of u dash, which is the differential or the derivative, du with respect to dx. And if you were to differentiate any ln term, right, you would simply get n uh, ln of x to the n minus 1. And one more thing. Whenever you have a chunk in brackets and you are doing differentials, you must always remember to multiply by the derivative of whatever is in your brackets. So the differential of ln x is 1 on x. So fully differentiated, remembering that little part that students always forget, the differential of u is n ln x to the n minus 1 multiplied by 1 on x. Now, for clarification, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 1 on x and I'm kind of, kind of going to bring it over here so that it looks nicer and cleaner. Good job. So what we're going to do here is we're finally going to start to put things together. So our question goes like this. They're saying that f n of x is the integral of ln of x to the n dx. We have changed our question to become this form, the integral of 1 dot ln x to the power of n dx. 
Multiplying by 1 does not change our question in any way. And because it's now in an integration by parts format, we have written our question in this form. Therefore, our answer will follow what's after our equal sign. So next up, we will begin writing equals u. And u in our question is denoted by this. So we will simply write down ln x to the power of n. What else? Next, we have v. And v is found to be x. So I think we'll write it in front. All right, so we'll write that there. And we follow up with that popular minus sign, our integration sign. Then we have v. We are going to write v next. What is v? Um, once again, v is x. So we'll write x here. And then finally, we have to write u dash. What is u dash? u dash is this entire thing over here, right? So we are going to write that n over x, and we have multiply by ln of x to the n minus 1, and don't forget that dx at the end. And there we go. Now we can cancel, because you can see these x's will cancel here. And in my next line, what I'm going to do is just do a little clean up here. Now, when you are doing these questions, always be sure if there are proofs, you keep looking at what you are required to show. And I can see I already have this term. So I know I'm going on the right track here. And I continue. Um, I see they have pulled out the N outside. So I'll pull out my N here. And I continue with what's left. All I have left is ln of x to the n minus 1 dx. Now, comparing that with this, I am only missing this little part of my answer. So how can I make that look like what I have here? Well, if you go back to the question, they said f sub n is equal to that. Well, what about if we were to, you know, just twist that around a little bit by extension, that must mean that if n were n minus one, then it would be the integral of ln x instead to the power of n minus one dx. Isn't that so? So that means that this, which is the same as this, could be replaced by f sub n n minus 1 x. That is what we are going to do here, right? So my last line, I'm going to write x ln x to the power of n minus n. And this part here is going to be replaced with f sub n minus 1 x because they are equivalent to each other. Okay, guys, and that's a wrap. You start off your question with the words proof. I always forget, <laughs> right? Start off with proof and end with your QED box or whatever you do to end your proof. And you can see we have finally shown that our answer is what they ask us to do. So stay tuned for the next part coming up soon. Okay, so our next part, upon first glance, it looks very, uh, what's the word, spiffy. All right, meaning uh, it could be exciting, it could be really scary. And uh, once again, it's definitely a proof because of those words show that. So we are going to start off our answer, right? If there's nothing else we know how to do, maybe the examiner, the marker will give us marks for knowing how to start a proof, right? Proof. Okay, so um, they said hence or otherwise, and um, I highlighted the previous part of the question over here because we will be needing this information, right? Because from the previous part, we were asked to show that f sub nx is equal to all of this on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side here. So let's look at this. Show that f sub 3 is equal, minus f sub 3, 1 is equal to a very long... One, two, three, four terms there. So how do we begin this question? Well, for me, 
I think I will start from the left hand side. So the left hand side goes like this, right? Left hand side goes like this. It's saying F3 of 2 subtract F3 of 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to find out what these values are, put them together and see if I will end up getting my right hand side. Okay, well, I am supposed to. So where do I get these values from anyway? We need to look around our question. The word hence means that we need to look in the previous part. So the previous part gives us this and this. Now, if we use the first one with the integral sign, right, let's just say we used it, then f sub 3, 2 will look like this. The integral of our ln of, let's see, over here, n is 3 and x is 2, right? Um, taking that information from this, they're saying f sub n of x, right? So whatever value is over as the sub, that's the value of n, and whatever value is in brackets is our x value. So over here, my x value is 2, okay? And continuing on there, my n value, right? My n value, which is what I'm looking for here, is 3. So this will be raised to the power of 3, right? Um, so using that first part here, right? This is what you get. Now, when it comes to lons, you don't want powers. You really don't. So clearly, the hence does not come from that first bit of information. So maybe we have to use this part, right? So let's go ahead and try using that and see what we come up with, all right? And I'm showing you the um, thought process that goes into an exam. Some students may pick the right item to use right away. But this is the thinking process behind it, right? You try something, it doesn't work. You don't get frustrated. You go ahead and you try something else. So I'm also seeing down here, they have f, f sub nx is equal to some sort of uh, expression. So once again, the n value comes from down here and the x value comes from above here, right? So if I use this part on my right hand side when n has a value of 3 then let's just work out f sub 3 2 what will that be equal to let's work it together or separate well let's let's work it together all right so you have something f sub 3 minus when we're working out f sub 3 with 1 we'll work that out separately so let me just spread this out a bit right let me erase this and clear this up for you guys. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out f sub 3 of 2 in this one minus f sub 3 of 1 in this one. And we'll see what we come up with, right? And of course, we will be using uh, this over here the ex as the expansion. Take note that n, n comes from the subscript. So in this first one, we have n being 3 and x being 2. And in the second one, the subscript is n once again. So n is also 3 here, but this time the x value is 1, right? Because the x value, according to the question, is the 1 in brackets, right? So that's where I sourced those values from. Now, I'm going to make my left-hand side look like my right-hand side over here and here, okay? So let's get into it. So the first thing they have is x ln x to the power of n. So my x is 2 here, so I'll write 2. Then we will write ln of 2 again to the power of n. n is 3 here. Minus n, which is 3, f to the 3 minus 1, and brackets x. My x is 2. So I really needed those large brackets. All right, now we're going to work this one. So once again, that right-hand side starts out with x. In this case, x is 1. And you have ln of 1. That's going to cancel. You know, ln of 1 is 0. So we won't cancel just yet. To the power of 3 minus 3, f to the 3 minus 1 of x is 1. 
All right, guys, so let's see what these things narrow down to. Let's start canceling if anything can. So you all know that um, ln of 1 is definitely 0, so you can just cancel that out. That goes to 0. So what will we end up getting? We will end up getting, uh, we have 2 brackets ln 2 cubed. Then we are getting minus 3 f sub 2 of 2. And then in this brackets here, we're going to get minus, well, minus by a minus, this minus multiplied by this minus is going to give us a plus 3 f sub 2 of 1. Not too shabby. Now I start comparing with what I am planning to get. When I compare, I can clearly see I already have that part there. So it's looking good. That gives me hope. Seems like I'm gearing up towards getting my answer. It also helps me knowing that there's nothing I need to do with that too because they have left it as is. So, so too will I leave it as is, okay? So let's continue working. Now you notice that the rest of the terms that we are trying to prove are all in terms of lons. There's no Fs present. So it seems like we need to completely eliminate them by repetitively using that same uh, um, little function that they gave us there, right? So that's what we're gonna do. So continuing with our answer here, we are going to find out what f2 sub 2 is equal to as well as f2 sub 1 is equal to. So we're going to do some a large amount of spacing, right? We want to do a lot of spacing, right? So we don't make any mistakes. So we're going to leave this bit here, right? That's a nice, nice part. That's correct and stuff. We're going to have minus 3 and then a bracket. Okay, and then we're going to have plus 3 and then a bracket or whatever that works out to be. Once again, for this part, we will identify that for this part here, we have n, right? n is 2 as well as x is 2. And over here, we have n as uh, 2, but this time we have x being 1. Remember, according to this, x is the 1 in brackets. So that's how I'm getting my values. So we go ahead and we apply that right hand side and it goes like this. I think I'll write in red x, which is 2, right? And then we have ln of 2 to the power of n. n is also 2 minus n again, which is 2f of n minus 1, which is 2 minus 1. And then finally in brackets you have x. Next one, we're going to work F2 sub 1, right? We're going to work this part here. So F2 sub 1 will be, let me see, X is 1, and then you'll have ln of 1 to the power of N, which is 2, minus 2 F of 2 minus 1, and X has a value of 1. Let's see what cancels. So clearly, we will have this going to zero because ln one is zero. And uh, we can clean this up and we can see what's happening here, right? So after cleaning this up, we have two ln two cubed, and we're gonna expand brackets here to get minus six, three twos are six, um, ln, 2 squared, and I could already see that uh, that's one of the other values that we are trying to prove. That's there, so we're on track. Then we have a minus multiplied by a minus giving us a plus. So that's plus 3 by 2 gives us 6f. 2 minus 1 gives us 1 there of 2. And this is something we need to get rid of because the Fs are not present in the uh, proof plus, well, actually it's a minus because we have that plus multiplied by this minus sign. So you're going to get minus 3 to the 6 F sub 1 of 1. And it seems that every time we attempt to work out a section, we 
narrowly get closer and closer to the answer. So I'm kind of excited, right? Now, as soon as I start to see F sub 1, what's hitting me is a bit of iteration here. You know, when you're fine using the iteration rules, um, usually you kind of, whenever your integration hits that number of 1, you go back to the original, right? And see if your function can be integrated when you have a value of 1. So let's just consider up top here, let's just consider what if you had um, f of uh, 1 of x, what's going to happen there? Then that would mean you have the integral of ln of x to the power of what? n, which is 1, which is just ln of x dx. So that's a good point to note there that when you are narrowing down to this function, where you have f of 1 and f of 1 of 2 and f of 1 of 1, um, you can simply just go to that integration and you can try to attempt to work it out and see what you get. But I'm going to attempt to keep on track with uh, using this expansion here on your right hand side and see if it works. If it doesn't, then I will go ahead and try to use this up top here. So this is how you should be thinking for exams. Sometimes you never know when you need to use a different aspect or component. Um, excuse me for minimizing the screen. I'm trying my best to keep this answer in one page, okay? All right, so we're going again, um, alternating colors here. We have uh, two, we have ln of 2 cubed, and we had that minus 6 ln of 2 squared, right? Nice. Then we're going to add 6 by something, and then we're going to minus 6 by something, okay? Now, over here, we have n being 1, and we have x being 2. And over here, we have n being 1 and x being 1. So let's see what values we get inside this bracket here. Well, when, n, when x is 2, we will get 2 ln of 2 to the power of 1, right? And then you will also get minus n, which is 1, by f. 1 minus 1, which is 0. I think I'll leave out that 1 in front there. So we'll just have minus f sub 0 of x, which is 2. And then across on this side, when x is 1, you'll have ln of 1 to the power of 1 minus 1, f of 1 minus 1, which is 0, and 1. What can cancel? This will go to zero. So let's see what's happening here. You have your lovely ln 2 cubed minus your 6 ln 2 squared, right? And then over here, expanding brackets, we will get plus 6 to the 12. Uh, that's ln 2. And I can see that in my answer already. It's right up here. So it seems that every time we apply that expression, we seem to be getting a part of the answer. Okay, so that's great. And then we're going to continue. We're going to get minus 6f0 of 2. Then continuing, we'll get minus 6. Well, actually, it's plus because a minus by a minus gives us a plus f0 of 1. Okay, so we're getting very, very, very close to our answer, guys. Very close. And um, the thing about it is that we can keep doing this, or I think at this point in time, I'm going to see what happens if I were to find f of 0 in this uh, function here. If I used f of 0, then my power up here would be ln x to the power of 0. And you guys know anything to the power of 0 is just 1, right? So this is really just simply 1 dx. So f sub 0 of x is just the integral of 1. 
right? So a little bit of a working column here. We are picking up from the very original integration that s sub 0 of x is just the integral of 1. So therefore, that means that f sub 0 of x is just simply x, right? That's just simply x. And uh, if that's simply x, then that means we can apply this to what we have here and here. So let's see what happens in applying that, all right? So we're gonna scroll here. We're gonna continue rewriting our answer. We have two ln two cubed minus six of ln two squared plus 12 ln two. It does feel good, doesn't it, when you see your answer coming together? Anyway, we still have to hold on here. So what's our f0 of 2? Well, over here, we can highlight that x has a value of 2 there. And over here, x has a value of 1. So continuing using this, whatever value is present in brackets, it seems like that's the answer. So f sub 0, let me just clarify what I'm saying, right? Based on what we have here, guys, f sub 0, x is x. It generates, it implies that if you had f 0 of 1, then that'll be 1. If you had uh, f 0 of 2, that's 2. If you had f 0 of 3, it's 3, and so on, right? That's kind of what it's implying, right? So using that implication, we're going to say safely that it must mean that f sub 0 of 2 is 2 plus 6 by f sub 0 of 1 is 1. All right, and we can definitely see we're going to get the answer there because 6 by 2 gives us 12, right? So I'm going to change this to 12, right? This is 12 here. And then 6 by 1 gives us 6, all right? And of course, negative 12 plus 6 works out to be negative 6. All right, and that works out to be negative six. And I believe this is what we had to prove. All right, let's just double check. Yes, it's definitely a uh, minus six there. Okay, guys, so hence, using that previous knowledge, uh, we were able to prove what the question asks. Now, I know a painstaking question all students have is, Miss, how do you know when to go back and use that original integral? Well, once again, with iteration, you would notice the pattern usually happens whenever you have that, uh, that subscript being zero. That's usually when you go back to your integral sign and you see if you can find a perfect integral for whatever is written after that sign, right? So it's usually when this value here is zero that you go to the original integral, right, guys? So I hope that helps. Stay tuned. We are going to continue doing 2018 up next. So hold on. Don't give up. You'll get there. Okay, so on screen, we are definitely um, looking at an integration question, clearly because of that integral sign. And this is uh, 2018 here. And um, I think this is part of question two. And... Uh, Initially, when you observe this, you are seeing two functions. You have an algebraic function and then you have a trigonometric function, right? Now, whenever you have two functions being multiplied like that, a lot of students like to apply integration by parts, which is not wrong. But the only concern here is that that um, cos of the angle, this part here, that's a power. And when you're integrating stuff, uh, when you have trig functions, the powers, it you just... It's so difficult. So before we can apply integration by parts, right? So for sure, the types of integration we are going to use to attempt this question is integration uh, by parts for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be the first one we're going to use. Um, what we're going to do is attempt some um, sort of substitution, right? So we're going to um, use some sort of uh, substitution here, sorry. All right, so we're going to use uh, some sort of substitution so that 
we can get rid of that complex uh, x cube component associated associated with the trigonometric angle right and um usually you want to use a substitution such that your angle is doesn't have a power so let's just use the letter um t substitution that we are going to use is let t be equal to that angle the angle is x cubed you could have used any letter you wanted right and of course if you're using a substitution you must also get a value for dx so to get that in terms of t what we're going to simply do is differentiate dt with respect to dx and you'll get uh that's 3x squared there yeah so therefore from here making the x the subject because we need to know what dx is going to be equal to to substitute it back in there so just a quick switcheroo oops just a quick switch there the x is going to be equal to uh well to make it simpler i'll show you guys something on screen all i'm doing is actually switching those two terms right so dx is equal to this thingy here so let's go ahead and substitute and see i know we have this x to the power of 5 present here but when you are using substitution what you want to do is once you get a value for dx and you use your whatever you let uh be equal to whatever once you substitute those two items into your integral things tend to, tends to cancel i think i got a little bit tongue twisted there things tend to cancel so let's see what happens and if we need then maybe we'll uh go ahead and make other stuff the subject of the formula so we can get a value for x5 so we had from the start we had the integral of x to the power of 5 cos of x cubed dx and we are now going to transform it in terms of t so we still have that x5 there yes we know we are keeping that in mind but we're going to go ahead and see what our um, substitutions are going to result in we have cos of t and that dx over here let me just highlight from here we have found dx to be equal to dt all over 3 x squared of course it's just dt over x squared but it's being multiplied so this is legal to do right and doing that you can see that we're gonna have some cancelings happening right so i can take that three from the denominator and i can actually uh just you know pull it outside as a third out there and my squared is going to cancel and this is going to become a three over here right so i'm just going to erase that so after substituting in all our values for t, replacing the x, we still have terms in x that we need to get rid of. But here's the beautiful thing, right? Initially, we let t be equal to x squared. And over, x cubed, sorry. And over here, we have x cubed. So guess what? We can actually just simply replace that with t. Boom. We just substituted and got rid of all of our x's. Good job. Good job. Good job, guys. Now, from here, it's in a nicer form. And we can go ahead and we can use our wonderful integration by parts. Okay, guys? So those are some of the uh, critical issues to look for before you apply integration by parts. Is my question too complicated to use integration by parts? A signal comes when you have trig functions with double angles, sorry, angles to powers and so on. That's, you use some substitution to simplify it. Okay, so let's begin. Um, now, using integration by parts means that you have to let u equal to something and your uh, b prime equal to something. So in this question, um, there's actually an acronym I use to help me uh, decide which ones should be my U, which ones should be my V. It's Leati. <laughs> and uh, I'll just tell you guys that my U over here, I have made T. And that's because my A stands for algebraic terms, right? Algebraic terms meaning like X, Y, Z. T stands for like trigonometry terms like cos, tan 
cosine, sine, etc. E stands for like any form of exponential terms. I stands for like um inverse terms. L if you have log terms present and so on. So I kind of start from the top here. And if I don't see like logs present or inverse functions present, if I see algebraic functions first, then that's what I'll make my U. And usually using this acronym really helps because it's um is usually the best way to pick what your U should be. All right, it results in the best, the fastest way of doing integration by parts. So you can use it if you like. Okay, so integration by parts goes like this. You have uh, the integral, it's right in your formula on the screen there, you have the integral of U, V prime dx splits up into uv minus the integral of v u dash. Um, this is if your question is in terms of dx. In this case, our question is in terms of dt. So we'll just change that around a bit so it satisfies our particular question. And we'll go ahead. And in order to work this question, we need to generate values for u prime as well as we need to find the value of v. So before we can substitute, we need to find out those two values. So I'll just go on the side here, all right, and I'll write them down. So we have that u is equal to t, which means that u prime is just simply the differential of t, which is one. And we also have that our v dash or v prime, however you wanna say it is cos t. So therefore v, which is the integral, right? The integral of cos is just simply sine. So very, very nice, very, very easy. We are going to put this together. Um, u is t, v is sine of t. Let's put that in some brackets, minus the integral of what's v? Sine of t once again. What's u dash one? So we're not going to write dot one, that's just one, dt. And we all know that the integral of sine is just simply uh, minus cos. So we'll write that down there. And um, the integral of sine is minus cos, so the sine will change here. And of course, we bring back our t and sine t uh, there. Now, one thing you have to remember is that going back to your question, remember that you had that third outside of your brackets there you are only integrating what's after your integral sign so you have to remember at the end to bring everything together so let's bring everything together in this question start putting our answer right all together so from the very beginning of the question we had to find the integral of x5 cos of x cubed dx and we found that equal to third, let me write this in a different color. Okay, we found that equal to one third, right? And it was one third of what? It was one third of what we just found. We found the integral of all of that to be equal to third of uh, sine t plus cos t. All right, nice and easy. And we're almost done. The only thing you need to remember is that your integration started off to being in terms of x. So what you have to do is go back and use your substitution that you had. t was equal to x cubed, and you want to write that back in. So over here, this is supposed to be x cubed. Over here, this should be x cubed. And over here, this should also be x cubed now of course this question was not a proof so i know in exams when you see an answer like this you're always doubting yourself and thinking is this correct but i mean <laughs> there's no way to know for sure you just have to trust yourself that hey i know i substituted correctly hey i used integration by parts flawlessly i did not make any mistakes my answer cannot be simplified any further there are no integral signs left so ask yourself is there anything further that i can do if the answer is no and it's not a proof question then you must accept that you have done your best and your answer most likely is correct okay guys 
So just move forward. If you have time at the end of the exam, you could perhaps give it another go on a fresh, clean piece of paper. That's the best way to check over an answer and see if you uh, made a mistake somewhere. Okay, guys, so this is the answer to this question. I hope if you were working along with me, you happen to get it as well. Stay tuned. There are more parts to this paper. Okay, so the next question looks very, very different. And it's interesting, in this year, they brought so many difficult integration parts. Uh, they tested integration by substitution, then they tested integration by parts. Now, what can help you is that they will never test the same type of integration in a paper. So chances are, for this question, that's going to work to your advantage because definitely um, integration by parts and integration using substitution method perhaps is not the way to go using that kind of to your advantage. You don't double test the same type, right? So um, what are we going to do? Now, first of all, there's a square root sign on the bottom. Think to yourself, when there's a square root sign on the bottom, what type of integration can I use? And also we have exponents. Now, it's kind of hard at first try. Looking at it, you're thinking, your brain is processing. Hmm, well, I'm going to do the shortcut here and just tell you. We can use integration by recognition. Now, recognition means that you have to recognize something already being a perfect integral. And the one you're supposed to recognize for this question, strangely enough, even though it's an exponential, I'll show you how soon, is that you needed to recall this form of one, the integral of one all over the square root of a squared minus x squared being equal to sine inverse of x on a. That's the integral recognition that you're supposed to think about in trying to do this question. Now, how are the two exactly alike? Well, here's what we can do. We can make this integral look like that form, right? So we have that e to the two x on top. We'll think about how to get rid of that pretty soon, right? Now, on the bottom, we notice that uh, the form we're trying to get is a squared minus x squared, but we have one minus e to the four x. We can make that one become one squared. So we have that squared sign there, right? We have that squared sign there and we can make that one become one squared minus, and how can we may make e to the power of four x look like kind of like a something squared? Well, if we have e to the 2x all squared, that works, right? That definitely works, such that our a is 1 and our x is e to the 2x. Do you see it? Do you see that format? Perfect. Now, using this recognition, because we are able to see that, hey, it looks like a perfect integral, we can observe that denominator. And we can simply, using integration by recognition, say that, hey, well, therefore, this is equal to leaving that numerator untouched, right? This must be equal to, uh, well, just a moment. I have to remove my integral sign for a second, right? Leaving that numerator untouched, we have e to the 2x there, right? And after integration, you're supposed to get sine inverse of x on a. Now in this question, I don't know why I wrote, I'm sorry, e to the 2x there. It's actually a multiplication, right? It's just sine inverse of x on a. Now, what is x? Well, our x was being replaced with e to the 2x. On what is a? Our a is just simply 1. So we can just clean this up here and just simply have sine of e to the 2x. But remember, 
This standard integral works with a numerator of one because when you are integrating, right, you have to consider the term that is being squared and you have to differentiate that term. The differential of x is one and you write that on the top. Your numerator, you have to essentially divide. You have to remember when you're integrating, you have to divide by that uh, derivative of whatever is in your brackets, right? So over here, you notice that in this case, our x is e to the 2x, right? Now, what is the derivative of that? Derivative of that is simply 2e to the 2x, right? So you have to remember when you're integrating, what you need to do in addition to just recognizing a standard format is remember to divide by your derivative of your x. So dividing by your derivative of your x will give me 2e to the 2x. And then this ends up canceling out. So that no integration needed to take place with that exponential function. So this entire thing just simplified into one half. And that's it there. That is your answer to this question. It went for quite a lot of marks because I am being honest, it was very difficult to recognize <laughs> that we had to use sine inverse. And it also would have been a, a bit tricky to realize that or remember rather that you always have to divide out that component of the derivative of the chunk. Okay, guys, so just keep practicing. Just keep exposing yourselves to questions like these. Also, I'd like to add that I noticed that these um, standard derivatives, tan inverse of x, etc. They're all coming. I'll just write this one on screen. Um, this standard form is 1 over uh, a squared plus x squared, just so you guys know if it comes. And you have to recognize something being the perfect integral of a tan inverse. It's in the form 1 over a squared plus x squared. So look out for it, you know? Um, look out for it. It might come in your year. Okay, guys, so stay tuned with me for more. Okay, guys, um, somebody just pointed out to me that I forgot to write my plus C. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you have to write your plus C when you're integrating. Okay, guys, so this is actually uh, the final answer there. Sorry about that. Yes, I got ahead of myself. Okay, on to the next question. Okay, so we're officially on the last part of, I think this is still, yes. We are officially, guys, on the last part of 2018 when it comes to integration. When I say the last part, um, I will be doing a tutorial on partial fractions, right? Um, actually, I already did one. And in that tutorial, because I didn't really want to mix up the topics, you can go back and check that tutorial where we used partial fractions to split up this uh, fraction here into these two parts, right? But I did not do the part B to it because the part B was integration, which is a whole other topic. And I said I would come back to it in this uh, tutorial on integration. So here we are, and we're going to do that part now. So the first part to that question um, resulted in splitting of a large fraction into two lovely partial fractions. Then the question said, hence, determine the integral of this whole chunk here. Now. Whenever you are able to split a large chunk into partial fractions, then all you simply need to do is state that, therefore, the integral of that large chunk is the same as the integral of each of your partial fractions, okay? So this one will just be the integral of 1 on x dx, subtract uh, the integral of 2x on x squared plus 1 squared. Now, that's a scary squared whenever you see stuff like this. Yeah, you got to better get your game on. <laughs> a lot of thinking to do, right? That's why you start to have to think about when you see square roots and squares, you know, and cubes on the denominator, you start thinking, what do I do here? Recognition, substitution, integration by parts, help me. So you really got to 
think along those lines, right? Some students apply all three and see which one works, right? But with experience, you'll get a custom. So straight off the bat, you guys are familiar that the integral of 1 on x is simply uh, ln x, right? So we, we leave that as it is right there. And of course, I won't write ln x plus c because um, I'll write that c at the end of these two integrals, okay? Now, we want to get into the integral of the second part here. We have a fraction. What do we do? Well, I'm going to try to bring that fraction up top because the power is 2. So I know I can write that power as minus 2 here. And I want to show you guys a trick. Now, I know a lot of you guys are seeing integration by parts here. You're thinking u, v prime, you know. Yeah, but it probably is going to be very, very long. Here's a trick. Something you guys should think about in exams. If a question looks like a product, like it is here, right and you're thinking integration by parts consider the i would say larger of the two products the one that looks more complicated consider what's inside brackets and if let's just say that we call that f of x you know just for a function if the derivative of that function the derivative would be f dash right if the derivative of what's inside brackets looks anything like your simpler product, then there's an easy way, instead of integration by parts, to do this integration, and I'll show you today. So in brackets here, we have x squared plus 1. Now the derivative of x squared is actually 2x, which happens to be one of our first, well, our first uh, functions present over there. So instead of using integration by parts, we are going to use this knowledge to our advantage. There's actually a rule um, that talks about if you have something of the form where you have um, the derivative of a function being multiplied by the function itself to some power, right? Um, then your derivative looks like, uh, well, sorry, the integral of. Your integral looks like uh, on the x here. <laughs> Your integral would look like f of x to the power of n plus 1, because remember, you're integrating, you divide by the n plus 1, and then it's just plus c, right? So if you can ever find a situation where you have a product and you're integrating, one of the functions is the derivative of the other. And the bigger function is raised to a power, then you can apply this rule. Now, instead of thinking of it as a long formula to remember there, because it looks lengthy, right? Here's another way you can shortcut the thinking process. Yes, you pick the larger of the two functions. In this case, it is x squared plus 1. And yes, you do need to differentiate it and you get 2x. Once you make sure that one of your products is the derivative of the other, very easily what you do is you only work with your larger function and you just simply integrate that function. So integrating that function, let's see what we'll get. So we just focus in on this large function. Let's integrate normally as if it was standing alone. So integrating that, you'll get x squared plus 1. Now remember when you're integrating, you have to add 1 to your power, and whatever value that is, you have to also divide by it. So negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, and we will divide by that negative 1. Now usually when you're integrating, what you usually do is you divide by your derivative of your chunk. Now the derivative of our chunk here is actually 2x, right? Because the derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. Now, what you do, after you, have you, after you have only worked with that one function alone, you go back and you look at your other function, right? And what you do is you simply write it. If it was on the numerator, you write it on top. And watch what happens. It cancels itself 
out. So instead of thinking about that very long formula, you can use this shortcut method of focusing on the bigger function. You could go ahead, different, um, integrate it. Remember to divide by the derivative of whatever is in the chunk. And then bring in your first function that you had before it and see what cancels. Take note that this type of integration only works if you get a cancellation of all your variables present in your function. So for example, if this were 2x squared, what would have happened is that you would have had 2x squared on top here, and after canceling, you would have still been left with an x. So therefore, this method would not have worked, okay? So um, there are certain conditions you must make sure are met when using this question. Um, that cancellations happen. So we will go ahead and we would write plus c and we'll bring back down that ln x there that we had from previously. Um, we are going to bring in that minus sign but this minus and this minus is going to make a nice plus sign up here. Remove that over and if you want you can rewrite this as 1 over. You can rewrite this as 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, guys? And that is your final answer. Hope you guys understood it. I hope you guys learned some tips and tricks. And um, be sure that you use my strategy when trying to integrate. There are so many different methods. Um, if it's been used before in the paper, chances are you have to use another strategy. Okay, guys? So stay tuned. Up next, 2017. Okay, so guys, glad you stuck around. We are finally on 2017, and I don't know <laughs> if we might end here. Well, not at this question, but 2017 has a lot of integration, like a whole lot. So it depends on the time frame. If this video is running too long, I'll have to stop at 2017. Maybe do 2016 and 15 and two other videos, but um, we'll see how it goes, okay? So... Let's read this question and see if we can do it. Use integration by parts to derive the reduction formula. I love that they told us what type of integration by people to use because it really helps. So up on screen, I have written the integration by parts formula. For those of you who can't remember it, I use B prime and U prime, you know, just to mean that those are derivative functions, right? Those have been differentiated. Okay, um, so they want us to derive the reduction formula a i to the n is equal to x to the n, this thing, right? Where i n is given by this. So where do we start? Well, if we have to use integration by parts, we need to integrate something. So we definitely can't start from here. And plus, that's what they're asking us to derive, okay? It's kind of a proof. But I'll write, um, I'll write, uh, what derivation or deriving <laughs> should we, let's just write derive. Okay. I know the English isn't perfect, but yeah, let's go. So, um, required to derive a to the I N is equal to, well, let me just erase this here. We are required to derive that. So make sure you write your proper statements. Okay i to the n minus 1. And we are going to start from where? We are going to start from the integral, which is i to the n, i sub n, sorry. Okay, and it told us to use integration by parts, so that's a good help. And using integration by parts, we just need to identify which one is your u, which one is your v. I told you guys I use an acronym called LIATE. And starting from the left, going to the right, this is how I decide which one uh, to make my u. All right, so this is my method of choosing my u. So if there are no logs, no inverse functions, no, uh, there's algorithmic functions in x. Right, so exponents are last, so therefore I will make my u this one. So therefore, by default, this is what I'll make my v. Right, so those are some of my little tips and tricks on picking your uh Perfect U on your perfect V prime. It works almost every time. Just almost. 
Okay, and if we have our U, we'll go to the side here and we'll write out everything that we have. If we have U being equal to X to the N, it means we need to find its derivative. Okay, and to differentiate that, you'll just get X N, X to the N minus one. And also if you have V prime that's already differentiated, it means that you just have to integrate this. And if you are integrating an exponential function, it's just the same function, except you divide by the derivative of that power. So the derivative of ax is just simply a. Okay, so let's go. Putting it all together, using that uh, integration by parts formula, we have to write u next, which is x to the n, right? So that's i n, and that's x to the n there. And then we are going to write our v, and our v is e to the a x all over a, all right? And follow that up with a minus sign, integral sign, then we have a v. So that's e to the a x. I think I'll bring that a on the outside here. So I'll have one on a, all right? And then finally multiply by u prime, and u prime is n. So I'll also bring that n on the outside here. So we'll have n on a, on n on a, and we have remaining x to the n minus 1. So all I did is I just simply substituted my four values based on their location in the integration by parts formula, okay? No rocket science there. And uh, at this point, what I'll do is just take a glimpse at what I am aiming towards getting. And I can see I kind of already have this, except I have that a on the bottom, but... In my answer, they have a over at the um, left-hand side, so I can probably multiply across by a to get rid of that. Um, so I'm going good, right? I'm going okay so far. And um, what I'm going to do here is I'm noticing that they already have i to the n minus 1. So I am going to find out what i to the n minus 1 looks like, right? So on screen, i to the n minus 1 seemingly looks like the integral of, what's that, x to the n minus 1 e to the ax dx. Let's see if we have that over here. We have e to the ax and we have x to the n minus 1 dx. Boom! So that means that this whole thing here is the same as this whole thing here. So therefore, that means we can replace all of this with i to the n minus 1. Beautiful. And we have how many terms here? We have two terms. So seeing that both terms have the same common uh, denominator of a, we are going to multiply across by that a so that uh, we get rid of it on either side. Right? So we're multiplying across by a. So we end up getting exactly what they have asked us to derive. This one wasn't as bad as you thought, but how many of you looked at this question and then looked away immediately? It's literally like four or five lines, the ones that I raised. It wasn't that bad. So my advice to you guys is even though sometimes the question looks challenging, start from where you know, start from what you know, just start writing and see where the journey takes you. Most cases, you'll end up getting halfway through your answer and then, you know, it's a good start. It's better than leaving a blank page. Okay, guys, stay tuned with me. We have more of 2017 coming up next. Okay, guys, so we are definitely on our... Uh, this is 2017. All right. And like I said, we had a lot of parts to this question. So previously, we worked out our, our formula. We derived this. And I'm sorry if there's a little bit of noise in the background. My neighbor decided to uh, lawn mow at a very odd hour. It's very late. 
So anyways, <laughs> um, hopefully that doesn't affect the quality of the video. Okay guys, but we're going to follow through here. So they said hence or otherwise determine the integral of this. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, if I use the hence method, that means you'll have to use this from before. And it looks so complicated, I think I'll probably just use integration by parts because, I mean, it looks very simple. It looks nice, doesn't it? But even I <laughs> went into um, doing this question using integration by parts, and what I discovered is that you're going to be moving in circles a bit. You're going to have to perform integration by parts more than twice. So you might as well just go ahead and use hence. Usually the hence is the shortest way to get your answer. All right. So um, we're going to say hence. We're going to use what they have here. Now, they want us to find the integral of x cubed by e to the 3x, right? So if we were to write that and line it up over here, directly below what that form given was, then what we can quickly identify is that the value of n in this question, right? So I'll write that on screen. This question, the value of n that they are using is 3, and also that value of a that they are using is also 3. You want to make sure you gather up this information when attempting to plug in values into this section over here. Okay, guys? So let's just clean up that screen over there. Sorry about that. This is 3. All right? So cleaning these things up a bit. Nice. So essentially what they are asking us to find is I3. Okay, they want us to find the value for I3. So instead of using integration by parts here, what we are going to use is this. We are going to use A, I to the N, being equal to X to the N, E to the power of AX minus N, I, N minus 1. Now, in this question, we have values for n and we have values for e that we guarded from before. So we are simply going to substitute these values into our question. Now, personally, I don't like uh, little um, coefficients on the left-hand side when I'm working. I like to work directly with what the question is asking us for. So because the question is asking us for I3 and not AI3, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually carry across my A on the right-hand side such that we have a third, because A is 3, so that's a third of all of this, okay? So A was here, and A has a value of 3. So what I did is I just divided across by 3 on the other side. Also, I'm going to replace everywhere where I see A, I'm going to replace it with 3 because A is 3 for this question, as well as everywhere I see N, I'm going to replace it with 3 as well because N is 3. Okay, here is 3 as well. And 3 minus 1 will give us 2 down here. So I'll just change this to 2. So there we have it. Our first substitution, using our values, we have gotten I3 to be equal to a third of that huge chunk in brackets. Obviously, we know that the I2 present here is an integral, right? And this is very similar to that um, those iteration um, questions. And you know, usually what you want to do is work all the way down until you get to I0. So that's what we're going to do in this question. We're going to work that i2 all the way down until we get i0 okay and see what happens so let's go ahead and continue this question here we're going to have a couple of lines involved but we're going to take our time right we have a third and we are going to leave our x cubed and our e to the 3x untouched but we need to get values for i2 okay 
So what is I2 going to be equal to? Well, let's see. All right, so from before, let's just go back up top. Remember, I am using my I sub N to be equal to I chose to carry across my E. So I am actually using this form. For me, it's, it was simpler to use than with that E in front there. Okay. So using this here, remember from the previous question, we had that value of A to be equal to 3. And that A value is not going to change, but what does change is our N value. So over here, we have N being 2. So to get what goes in this space over here, we have to change our N to the value of 2 now. So we are going to write up here. So we are no longer using N as 3. We are going to use N as 2 for this part over here. Okay. So looking at this, we will get 1 over A. And A is still 3. So we'll get 1 over 3 brackets x to the n, which is x squared, e to the ax, a is still 3, and then minus n, which is now 2, i to the n minus 1. 2 minus 1 gives us 1. All right, um, we can expand out our brackets over here, and here is going to cancel. That's lovely. So we got rid of that there, and we will end up getting i3 to simply be equal to a third of x cubed e to the 3x minus we have x squared e to the 3x and then we have plus 2i sub 1. All right, so we're getting closer and closer to this over here. Maybe we just need to do one more wrong. So let's see how it goes. All right. So I'm just going to try my best to minimize the screen and continue working with no pause for concern about your eyesight. Okay, guys, so I know it's hard to see so much on a tiny screen. All right, so we're going again. We have x cubed e to the 3x minus x squared e to the 3x plus 2. And I'm going to open out a large bracket because we want to find out what's the value of I1. So when we're talking about I1, that means N has a value of 1 now. Okay, so this N for I1 will be 1. A is still 3. So using this once again, okay, this over here, we will get I1 is now 1 over 3 still because A is still 3. And we're going to have x to the n, which is 1, n is 1, so I'll just leave it as x, e to the ax, which is 3x, right? And then minus n, which is 1, i to the 1 minus 1, which is 0. Let's clean this up here. We will get i3 is simply equal to a third, huge brackets, x cubed, e to the 3x minus x squared e to the 3x plus 2 thirds, right? x e to the 3x minus 2i0, close my huge brackets. So we have finally encountered the part where we have i0. And why is i0 so important? Because you have been given... Um, a standard form for i n, right? Remember, with all iteration formulas, they will always give you the standard i n. And using that standard i n, what happens is that uh, whenever you reach a case where you have i zero, it means that some sort of cancellation happens. For example, here n is zero, so you will get x to the power of 0, which is 1, so that goes away. And then you also have e to the ax. In this case, a is 3, so we have e to the 3x dx. 
Now, if x to the power of 0 is 1, that disappears, and it gives us an integral which can easily be worked out. So that instead of using uh, this huge i n formula to work out a value for 0, and of course, you would get i to the minus 1 and so on, you know, you can't use negative values. Just go straight and direct to your integral and get a nice value which will completely eliminate all further integral signs. So to integrate e to the 3x, that's just simply e to the 3x divided by the derivative of the 3x, which is 3. And uh, you go ahead and take that value and you go ahead and you substitute substitute it back into your question, okay? So um, what I'll do here for the sake of space, I am actually just going to extend my bracket a little bit here. And I am actually just going to write my i0 right in to over here, right? So that's e to the 3x over 3. And um, I think I'll write that plus c at the end after. Okay, guys? And let's bring our answer together and see what we have come up with. Okay, and um, just one little error I realized also. Um, over here, when I was multiplying uh, 2 by 1 third, I got 2 thirds, which is correct. But I also um, forgot that 1 third is to be expanded in front each of these two terms. So over here, I was supposed to multiply 2 by 1 third by i0. So actually, this is supposed to be 2 thirds here as well, okay? So just a small little error there. Glad I picked up on it before this video was over. All right, guys. So let's put this bad boy together, shall we? So we will get a third multiplied by that first term would give us a third x cubed e to the 3x. Then a third multiplied by this is going to give us a third x squared e to the 3x. Then a third multiplied by two thirds is going to give us two ninths x e to the 3x. And then a third multiplied by two thirds multiplied by third again is going to give us two over 27 e to the 3x. And then finally plus c. Okay, guys, so um, that's your answer there. Once again, questions like these, you can't verify because they have not given you any form of a proof. But like I said, if you wanted verification, you can use integration by parts if you have the time. That would mean you're doing the question otherwise. And um, it would take quite a while, but you should end up getting the same answer. So if it's just, you know, biting you that I'm wondering if I made an error, I'm wondering if my answer is correct, you can justify it by verifying using another type of integration and see if they are equal. Okay, guys, so stay tuned. 2017 is just not over. I can only imagine how they felt when they did this paper. Wow. Um, on screen, we have uh, two functions here. Uh, it looks like a quotient, but it's not differentiation, so we can't apply the quotient rule. Um... I'm seeing a lot of sign in this and 1 minus x squared. They look like very familiar um, functions. So what I'm going to pull out are essential integrals you should know. Right? So we know that the integral of, uh, let's just say, 1 over the uh, square root of 1, that's a squared minus x squared with respect to x, right, is equal to sine inverse of x, right, um, on a, right, this is a standard plus c, this is a standard integral that you guys should know, and um, how does this apply to this question? Well, Remember, I was saying that whenever you have something of the form, like you have a function and then a next function, and one of them are derivatives of each other and you have a power, well, this can also be applied very easily to our quotients as well if you really take your time and you understand how to do it. 
So looking at this question, right, um, we have to decide which one of these we want to choose to be our main function and which one is the derivative of the other. Now, we also know that if you were to uh, differentiate, all right, if you were to differentiate a sine inverse of x, we know that um, the standard differential for that is 1 on uh, the square root of 1 minus x squared. And you're clearly seeing that down below there, right? So if you were to differentiate sine inverse of x on top, so if this were a function, then clearly the derivative is found on the bottom below. All right? So let's get into this question and see how we can maneuver what we know to facilitate the type of integration that is required. Okay, guys, I just had to pause for a while because uh, the mowing sound is getting louder and louder. Okay, so um, yes, getting back to what I was telling you guys, where you have to kind of recognize that, you know, sometimes you have a function and its derivative present in the same, uh, whether it be a quotient or a product. Um, in this case, what I'm actually going to use is um, I'm going to use a little bit of substitution. I'm going to let uh, u, right? So I'm going to let u be equal to my function there. Right, my first function, which is a sine inverse of x, and then u prime, which is the derivative of that, which is the same as the f prime. We know that the derivative from here, the derivative of sine inverse of x is given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. That's why I wrote these statements down. It's important knowledge to remember. And um, let's go ahead and uh, recall that if you're differentiating something or integrating it, you always, and you're using substitution, you have to find for the values of uh, dx there, right? So we can just simply replace this f dash x with du dx, because we are differentiating u with respect to x. And if uh, du dx is equal to this, we can simply make the x the subject of the formula. The x would simply be equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared multiplied by du. I am performing a simple cross multiplication here to get that. So now we are simply going to substitute these values into our integral. So our integral was between 1 and 0. We have sine inverse of x all over the square root of 1 subtract x squared delta x. And what we're going to do is convert that into a more formidable form. So we can see that u is equal to sine x here. So our numerator becomes u. And we still have that rock shaggedy 1 minus x squared, but maybe our dx can save us. So our dx from down here is the square root of 1 minus x squared. Yes, it does save us du. And those two end up canceling each other off beautifully so that we end up getting a nice, simple integral of u, du. And the integral of u is simply u squared on 2. All right, guys, and it's between limits, so there's no plus c. And we know from before that we had u set as sine inverse of x. So we can simply substitute that back in. We have sine inverse of x all squared over 2. And uh, let me just close this in a bit here. Shift it aside. And we are going to place that between our limits of 1 and 0. And then we could just go ahead and work that would imply that when you substitute 1, you'll get sine inverse of, uh, what's that, 1 all squared over 2. And then you would subtract, maybe I should have gone a little lower here. That's okay. Let me just write this over. I mean, I have space here now, but... All right, so we have sine inverse of 1. All right, all squared 
over 2. And we are going to subtract sine inverse of the second number there is 0. Close brackets all squared all over 2. And uh, you all know that sine 0 is just 0. So therefore, this entire thing is going to just get eliminated. And um, moving forward, I meant uh, sine inverse of 0 is 0 as well. Right, so we are left with um, sine inverse of 1, that is a pi on 4, pi on 2, sorry, that's 90, so that's pi on 2, all squared, and also we have that divided by 2. So when you work this out, you'll get pi on 2 squared is simply pi squared on 4, and then 4 by 2 is 8. So that gives us an answer of pi squared on 8. So the question was challenging. I will admit that. However, if you knew um, your standard integrals for arc sine functions and inverse functions, etc., it would have made it a whole lot easier. I want you guys to know that sine inverse, cos inverse, tan inverse, the integrals and differentials are definitely worth remembering because they tend clearly to be popping up as of late. So jot them number a couple of times, have them on, a, on your wall, pass by them, practice a lot of questions with them, and stay tuned for the rest of 2017. Okay, so guess what paper we're on? Yes, that's correct. We're still on 2017. Now, once again, when I was doing the partial fraction tutorials, I didn't want to mix topics, so I said I would come back to the integration part. So in 2017, there was the question where we had to use partial fractions to split up this uh, quotient here into three separate uh, fractions. And then they said, hence or otherwise, determine its integral. So usually what we do is we simply find the integral of each of those partial fractions individually, right? That makes the integration a whole lot easier. So we are going to go ahead and do that. And on screen to the right hand side, you would notice that I also placed a arctan function there. And that's because for this paper, they are really, really bringing it hard and heavy with those inverse functions. So I guess students who didn't prepare for knowing these things off by heart would have gotten a lot of questions uh, incompleted, right? So make sure that um, you check yourselves when it comes to knowing those functions. So the integral of one on x, that's uh, really, really easy, nice and simple. That's just one of x there. Um, plus, let's see if we can perform this integral. Now, this can be a long integral. Here's how you do it. Um, even when you have a variable on top, you can still find the ln if the differential cancels it out. So if we were to find, um, if we were to integrate this, you would get ln of x squared plus 4. Now, of course, when you are integrating, you need to divide by the derivative of what's in brackets. The derivative of x squared plus 4 happens to be 2x. And from before, we had that x present. So what's going to happen is that those x's are actually beautifully going to cancel out so that we do not have any existing variables. And it works for this question. So we can go ahead and apply um, those rules of logs there. So I'll just bring that half out in front here that we were left with. Okay, so once again, if you are using lons, whatever is in brackets, you have to like, for example, in this first one, right, the derivative of x is 1, which happens to be on the numerator. So we can write the answer as is. Similarly, in the second one, the derivative of x squared plus 4 is 2x. x belongs on the numerator, so it ends up getting cancelled. The 2 does not. So the 2, you flip it, turns into a half, it remains there. Okay, so um, that was good. Let's get on to this third part, which actually makes the whole question an actual question, because this is a difficult part. Isn't so difficult, it's just that students may have had issues of seeing it, right? So what we're going to do is, I forgot to write the integral sign. What we're going to do is we're kind of going to rearrange this x squared plus 4 into 4 plus x squared instead. 
so that it kind of follows the format here. And as well, we're going to turn that 4 into uh, 2 squared, right? So it's really in the form now. And being in this form, we can see that we have 2 squared plus x squared. So therefore, our a is equal to 2. So now that we have it in its perfect form, the integral of that is exactly equal to what's on the right-hand side. So we will get 1 on a, which we found a to be 2, tan inverse of x on a, which is 2. And then finally, there's no um, limits here, so we will just write plus c. And there you have it. That's the final answer for this integral. Um, it was kind of simple. It's just that you needed to remember your arc sine and arc tan and arc cost functions throughout this paper. Okay, guys, stay tuned. We're almost there. Hold on. Okay, guys. I just checked that was actually the end of 2017. So we're moving on to 2016. A much nicer people, a much nicer year. So uh, the question was easy enough to just write down. So I wrote it by hand. And um, I want to say when you're integrating, um, instead of always thinking about integration by parts, uh, when a question contains a mix of functions, and I don't mean you have one function being an exponential and the other being um, uh, trigonometric, I mean that in this second function here, it's a double function. You have sine of e to the x, sine of an exponential function. When you see something like that happening, it should signal something in your head that maybe integration by parts isn't going to work 100% here. Or it will be very long so the best bet is substitution you need to get rid of that e to the x being next to the sine x so what we're going to do is we're going to use a uh, substitution integration by substitution here right so we're going to use a substitution and we're going to let uh well usually i know they always use u or t right so we're going to let t be equal to e to the x, and therefore we will get dt, the x being equal to e to the x again. And um, we need to find out what the x will be. So doing a little bit of crisscross here, we'll get that the x is simply equal to dt on e to the x. Okay, and um, of course... We'll see if stuff cancels. If it doesn't, we'll figure out what happens, right? So going ahead, and uh, we have we have the integral of e to the two x. Let's make that e to the x squared for the sake of our substitution being e to the x, and then we have sine of e to the x dx. Let's start substituting and see how we could change this up. Well, first up. Before I actually change this to t squared, let me just work with this more complicated function, right? I'm going to change this to t, and I want to plug in my dx. Now, my dx is, uh, that's dt over e to the x, and here you can see that this e to the x is going to cancel with this one so that you no longer have squared, you just have e to the x. Now, I know some of you might be wondering, Miss, what if we actually went ahead and we used the t here so that from before we went ahead and we had our t squared, what would have happened? Well, the answer is nothing much. I mean, you would have not had that e to the x to cancel off, but remember, e to the x is still t. So you could have just simply replaced that with t, and in any case, anyhow you take it, it would still cancel, right? So no fear. Right? Sometimes you take the easier route, sometimes you take the more difficult route. In exams, the main thing is that you get there, right? So let me just clean up this here. I don't like how it looks. Bring that closer together. So nice, beautiful. Um, we have a integration by parts, right? So we're going to integrate by parts here. You might want to write out the words integrate by parts for the examiner. And I'm going to let my U um, be t and my uh, v prime be sine of t. So going to the side, just making sure you remember the uh, integral, uh, integration by parts formula, you have the integral of u v dash, right? Um, in this case, with respect to dt is equal to simply uv minus the integral of v 
u dash dt. Okay. All right. And we need some stuff, right? We have u is t. So therefore, that means u dash will simply be the differential of that, which is 1. And we also have v dash is sine of t. So therefore, we need to find v. v will be the integral of sine, which is minus cos of t. Let's go ahead and we just put everything together using this lovely integration by parts formula down below here. So we need to find out what our u is. Our u is t. What is our v? Our v is minus cos t. Uh, minus the integral of a v, which is minus cos t. So I'm going to make that sign positive. Multiply by, it looks like cos. <laughs> minus cos t. Multiply by u prime, which is 1. So we just leave this as dt here, right? And the integral of cos is simply sine. So that's sine t, right? Plus c. And we bring down our minus t cos of t. And pretty much uh, all we have to do is substitute back that value of t for e to, e to the x. And that's our answer. So um, doing that, we will just get minus e to the x cos of e to the x plus sine of e to the x. And you have your plus c. And that's it, folks. Not too shabby, not too bad. Um, but once again, you kind of had to use two methods, substitution and then integration by parts, right? So let's take note that that's a popular thing that happens um, when the questions look very easy. It usually requires two types of integration. Get accustomed to it. Look forward to it possibly happening in your paper. So instead of staring at the question, you can say, hey, you know what? Usually we have to substitute something first and then use integration by parts. How do I know what substitution to use? Look for where you see a combination of two sets of functions like sine of e to the x, difficult terms, right? That's where you make your substitution happen. Okay, guys, so stay tuned with me for more of 2016. Okay, guys, so finally, <laughs> I was wondering when I would get one of these questions. Seems like uh, they haven't brought a trapezium real question in quite a while, eh? Unless maybe I missed it. I don't think I missed out any questions from 2019 all the way down. So they have not brought a trapezium, brought a trapezium rule in a long time. I'm not sure about 2020. I haven't gotten a chance to see the look at the paper. It was multiple choice, I mean. And uh, well, 2021 is yet to be done, right? So I'm sure that trapezium rule is definitely coming. If it didn't come in 2020, any multiple choice, it's coming in 2021, right? Don't take my word for it. I'm just suggesting. <laughs> Okay, guys, so trapezium rule is nice and easy. Let's look at this question. So we have a function, and the function is restricted uh, for x values lying between and inclusive of 5 and 2. So with trapezium rule, one of the first things we need to find out is, uh, well, how are your intervals split up, right? So they said using the trapezium rule with three intervals. So we go ahead and we apply that formula for h where... We look at our width. Our width is 5 minus 2 because our x values lie within this range. All right. So that's where I'm getting the 5 and 2 from. And then we have to divide by how many intervals they are saying, which is 3. So that gives us a value of 3 over 3, which gives us 1. So boom, we found a value for 1. What's next when it comes to the trapezium rule? Well, we kind of have to remember that with the uh, trapezium rule, you know, some students um, really like to do a little sketch. Personally, I am an avid fan of sketches. I'm a visual learner. So you go to the side, you know, when you're, you're not 100% sure what that curve is going to look like. But just for the sake of having a sketch, I am going to um, just draw a little uh, curve there. And between the values of, uh, what's that, 2? And five, they're saying this region is split into three, right? So that means we have one, 
two, three. So that's two, three, four, five. So drawing a little sketch there kind of helps us gauge um, each section. And with each section, you know, students like to come up with a table of values, right? So you have those values for X and your X values are as follows. You have X being um, starting from two. Then you have three, four, and five. And then what you need to do is you need to find the corresponding values at where, where this function exists. Right, so simply to find f of x when x has these values, I'll do one for you. Right, so you go to the side and you say when x has a value of 2, my function, what is my function? My function is this big hunk of junk over here, okay? And you will see my function is x squared plus 2x plus 3 all over x minus 1 by x squared plus 1. So if x is 2, that means over here will be 2. And on my right-hand side, over here will be 2. Pretty much everywhere you see x, you just replace it with 2. Okay? And you go ahead and you solve for that value. And I'll just tell you guys up front that that value actually is, I believe, 9 on, no, 11 on 5. Uh, the value is 11 on 5. So I'll go ahead and I'll write that in here. This is 11 on 5 and I'll write it in my table. And what I'm going to do up next is I'm just going to simply list out the rest of values. You guys can verify by working on your own time, okay? So on screen, you would see that I just wrote in those answers for different values of x's. I really wanted to explain to you guys how these values are achieved, which is why I did a full example, because there are students who um, really uh, don't even remember how to do this, all right, for whatever reasons. But um, yeah, all right. So once you have successfully found your value for each and you have created your table, by the way, your table, what it does is that uh, by substituting those values of 2, 3, 4, and 5, what you're doing is you're kind of like estimating, you know, little area values kind of for each region of your uh, area under that curve there. All right. So now it's time to use our trapezium formula and we are going to put everything together. Okay. Okay. So on screen, I have written a formula that really makes the trapezium rule what it is, right? This is the area formula. You see, when you have a curve, right? Below that curve, there's a region that exists. And that region kind of looks like a trapezium if I were to consider these two points here. And I were to take a ruler and just simply connect those lines, right? Well, let me just draw that over. <laughs> That wasn't so straight. Okay, I'm trying. All right. So that kind of looks like a trapezium. And uh, the formula for a general trapezium is given by this here. I'll explain the formula just now. But I want to tell you guys that using this formula, if your curve is like a minimum curve like this, can tend to give you an overestimate of your answer. However, if your curve happens to look like this, it can actually give you an underestimate. So take note that the trapezium rule, when you're calculating the area under a curve, it does not give you an exact value. Now, with that said, I want to explain this formula. So the formula goes like this. The area under, your, well, the area of the trapezium really, is given by, first of all, a half of whatever you found for your value of h. In this case, we found h to be 1. So a half of h is just a half. All right? And then we have some huge jumbo brackets here. And in those jumbo brackets, what you write down are values that come from your table. Now, the first two values that are added that come from your table are always your first value and your last value. So f of x0 
is simply your first value, right? So that's 11 on 5. Then next, f of xn is your last value. So no matter how big or no matter how many um, things you have in your table, if you have seven values, the last one is what you would use for this part, right? So the first one plus the last one, that's standard. Then next step is to go ahead and add the sum of the rest, but you're going to double that sum. All right, so the rest of values we have are simply 9 tenths. So we'll write down 9 tenths here. Plus, the next one is 9 over 17. So we'll write that down here. So you simply just, if you had seven values in between, you go ahead and you write down the sum of those seven values in between. But remember to multiply them in brackets all by two. All right, guys. So that's how you apply the trapezium rule formula. A lot of students tend to just add up all the values in their table um, and they forget to multiply the middle values by two. All right, so from here, it's just getting an answer. Plugging that into your calculator will give you an answer of two point, I think it was nine one. Yeah, nine one. Um, no, it was seven one actually. I'm just double checking over here, right? It was 2.71 to two uh, decimal places, right? Two decimal places. And of course, our question didn't exactly give us like units. Um, usually for these questions, you never really get units, even though it's like an area. And uh, they never either do they state units squared at the end so um pretty much you know we just it's an area but it's unitless so leaving your answer in this form is just fine and uh you can double check with your calculator to make sure that uh you know you get 2.71 as well so guys stay tuned for more i think there's another kind of partial fraction integration later down in this paper so um if you guys are following along with me um i am pulling out questions from 2016 that all have uh, integration involved in them, right? Um, so here we go, stay tuned. Okay, so the last part of this 2016 paper involving uh, integration was the question on partial fractions. Be sure to watch my video on partial fractions where I actually um, did this question in terms of splitting up the function into this form here, okay? So, um, yeah, I did work on that question. And what they're asking us in the part after is to simply integrate. So usually in a lot of past paper questions, you should pick up on this. After they give you a complex function, they ask you to use partial fractions to split it up. And then immediately after, they'll ask you to integrate the function. So all you have to do by now, you should recognize that you simply integrate those partial fraction parts that you have found, those splits. All right, now for this question, we do have limits. So that's a nice thing, actually. I really like limits, uh, you know, instead of always writing that plus C all the time. And um, this one looks not too shabby. Uh, we have no powers involved. So I think we'll just get lons all the way. Let's see what happens. Um, pulling out our constants, because that's what I like to do to make things simpler. I'm going to pull those constants outside. So here we'll get three, and this breaks up into ln of x minus one. The derivative of x minus one is simply one, so there's no, no like division by anything. And uh, over here, let's see. Um, we have ln of x squared plus 1, right? And the derivative of x squared is actually 2x, right? So we'll divide by that 2x. And from before in the question, we had x up top. So what happens is that that x will cancel with part of your derivative. And tan god, because you are able to get rid of that variable. If that variable was left there, then you could not use lons to integrate. You would have had to use some other, maybe substitution or you know some, some other method to integrate, right? So it's a clean 
uh, elimination. So we can go ahead and just take that off. And also what I'm seeing is that I have a two here and a two here. So I'm also going to just allow them to cancel each other off. So we we'll clean up that nicely and we are just going to get that present between the limits. And from up here, it's just, you know, you substitute your values, you'll get what? Uh, ln of five minus one is four. Subtract ln of two minus one is just ln of one. Subtract ln of what? Five squared plus one, that's ln of 26. Minus ln of two squared plus one, that's five. All right, of course, you know, ln of one is going to go to zero. So here you'll end up with three ln four, subtract ln of 26 plus ln of five. Uh, you can leave your answer in this form, or you can go ahead and you can work out your answer correct uh, so the number of decimal places if you wanted to. The answer is just 2.51. All right, correct to three uh, significant figures. All right, guys. So, um, yeah, that's the answer there. This one wasn't too bad. Partial fraction questions tends to be really nice. So I know integration can be very challenging. It can be very tricky. Sometimes if you figure out, hey, I'm supposed to use an arc sine function, then you have some sort of substitution involved. Usually the most challenging integrations involve two types of integrations within the same question. Get your minds wrapped around that. Get, get accustomed to that happening. Ask yourself questions in the exam room. Write down all the types of integration you know and try, instead of staring at the question for a long time, Try attempting it using all the different types of integrations, you know, integration by recognition, integration by substitution, um, integration by parts, you know, whatever it takes. Um, don't give up, right, guys? And I'm sure if you have looked um, at this video from start to finish, you would be able to see patterns of repetition. It seems that um, not only are double methods of integration involved in questions, it seems that a lot of sine inverse, tan inverse, cos inverse is going to come, you know, so you should be familiar with those. It seems that always after partial fractions, you have to integrate, you know, so just get accustomed to it, right, guys? And um, I wish you all the best. Um, let's see if I, let me see how long this video is and I'll decide if I'll be doing 2015 today. Okay guys, just a quick glimpse at the time. It's been a hot minute, rather a hot two hours. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this video is going to take very long to process and upload. So I think I'll end here. Um, it was really, really, really good. I learned some more things. You always learn when you practice questions, whether you're a student or a teacher, you learn little tips and tricks here and there, right? Um, so I just want you guys to not feel discouraged. Um, keep practicing. Remember, effort means everything when you want to earn something. So you really have to put it in. You can't just, you know, stare at an answer two hours before the exam or even a week or two before the exam and expect that your brain is going to be able to process so much information. Love your brain. Help it work in slow, steady paces, small steps at a time right so that your processing speed can be optimized right guys i wish you all the best i will see you guys soon look out for my videos um i have covered the entire of module one i have done the complex numbers the differentiation the partial fractions as well as the integration where you have trapezium rule and iteration all of that included throughout videos okay so next up we'll be moving on to module two so hold on see you guys soon bye